I think we're in good shape. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Nice to see you. Yay. Uh, well, we'll get into it all, but we've had a chance to talk, but we've never met in person. So you're one of my very uh, lovely remote customers that I feel like I know super well. And then I'm like, oh, and there you are. Now I know what you look like. So um, anyways, I'm going to introduce myself in case anyone is new to the podcast. I am Melissa McLeod, and I am at the Wool and the Floss in Gross Point, Michigan, um, along with my partner in crime, Megan Holmes, at the Needlepoint Clubhouse in St. Louis. Um, we are the Pointing It Out podcast, and we love to talk about all things Needlepoint, and it um, seems like there's a few people that are interested. Um, and today I have Lauren Weiss with me, who um, I'll let you introduce yourself, but I'm like super excited to talk about this because I think you are a stitcher and you have a lot of professional accolades and we're going to talk all about why needlepoint is so important. And we can't worry about how much it costs because it's <laughs> cheaper than all the other things that can go wrong in our lives if we don't stitch. <laughs> Fair enough. Um... So I, I do go by Lauren Kochkowice or Dr. Kochkowice at work. Um, I'm the only physician in my family, so I kept my maiden name. And when I had kids, I hyphenated um, my last name. Um, but Weiss is a lot easier to say um, than Kochkowice. Um, but I'm a, so I actually, I'm a triple boarded physician. I did a combined training program at Tulane University down in New Orleans. Um, in pediatrics. Founding experience. Yes. My, it being my alma mater as well. Um, so I did pediatrics, adult psychiatry, and child and adolescent psychiatry, um, and stayed on there as faculty for a couple years before uh, coming back up to New Jersey. So I grew up in Jersey, um, and I had the opportunity to train new child psychiatrists in the area here, and so I took that opportunity, and so that's what I do for half of my job, and the other half of my job is um, seeing child and adolescent patients who come in with a wide range of mental health concerns. Wow. And I feel like you must have gone to college when you were like seven because you have like, <laughs> done all that. So I know I went straight through and looking back, I don't know if I would have done it if I didn't go straight through because when you come out of undergrad and you go to med school, you'll hear my little ones in the background. Um, all of my friends were working. All of my friends were working in the city. Babe, can you help Travis? My, I'm trying to get my husband to or to settle down the three-year-old a little bit. Okay. Um, Matt gets comments all, about all the time about how like she people love that she's keeping it real. So <laughs> you're keeping it real for us too. <laughs> yes. Yep. Um, so yeah, I, I went straight through. I did a combined program, which was nice because if you did everything sort of separate, it would have been eight years instead of five for uh, postgraduate training. And I apologize. Did you go to, I know you went to Tulane for medical school because you and I have talked about that. Where did you go yep. undergrad? So I went to Lehigh in Pennsylvania for undergrad, and then I actually went to medical school in New York um, and then did residency or my post-medical school training in New Orleans at Tulane. Okay. And I was smiling about Lehigh because I don't know if we've talked about this, but my grandfather went to Lehigh. Get out of here. I have this awesome necklace. I'll have to, I'll point it out someday when you're online with us. And it's, it's his wrestling medal from Lehigh. And granted, he was born in 1898. So we're mm -hmm. talking he was there in like 1916 or whatever. And it's his wrestling medal that my father had made into a necklace for me. It's totally awesome. So anyway. That's really cool. There's some good history there. Yeah. yeah. Um, Apparently his name's on some place in the chapel that people see it. So. Anyway. Yeah, we're not known for many sports, but wrestling we're pretty decent at. <laughs> Somebody else just told me that because I mentioned it to them. Uh, one of my local customers, her husband, I hope I have that straight, went to Lehigh and uh She's like, oh, you've heard of it? You know, because it's a smaller school, right? And um, so I was explaining it. She's like, oh yeah, we're great at wrestling. I'm like, that's so funny. <laughs> that, like, that's about it. My um, my sister actually went to Lafayette and she's a year behind me. So we went, Lehigh and Lafayette are big rival schools. They're about 10 minutes away from each other in Pennsylvania. Um, and so we would, you know, have the, the football game, um, but it wasn't, nobody really watched the game because we weren't, neither team was really good at football. Yeah. <laughs> Well, my husband always asks Sally, my youngest, who's currently at Tulane, um, if she went to the football game and she just rolls her eyes. She's like, mm -hmm. oh, you know, we don't go to the football games yet. Right. <laughs> Fair enough. We digress. Um, so you have been practicing for how long? Sorry. Oh, I graduated residency in 2016. 
So almost five years. Okay, good, good. And then you've got little ones at home. You've got a very full plate. I do two little ones, two boys, three and five. I love it. Uh, yes, very active. Good, good, good. And obviously, well, maybe not obviously, but I think I mentioned that you were a customer of my shop. So mm -hmm. as it does become obviously in your downtime, you enjoy stitching. Sure do. Um, so I learned how to cross stitch from a babysitter when I was a kid. Um, she would bring it over to the house and I still have a little pro my first little project I did on the blue cloth. It just, um, I did a little apple tree and she did my name and back stitch in cursive. Um, and so I cross stitched for a really long time, um, but would always find myself miscounting and would get distracted and throw, you know, the project would stay in a box for a long time because I didn't want to rip it all out and things like that. Um, and then when I was in New Orleans, I got really into the glitter um, crafting down there. It's a big Mardi Gras scene and a big Mardi Gras craft um, culture down in New Orleans. Um, and so I got really into that. And so I kind of put the needlework to the side a little bit. And then in 2019, when we were flying to move back up to New Jersey, the kids and I, believe it or not, there's a little needle point shop, um, needle arts in New Orleans. Um, that was a couple miles from my house that I didn't really know about until my last day in New Orleans. And so I stopped in, I got a couple of um, Mardi Gras ornaments. And I was like, I didn't know too much about it, um, but I knew it was painted and I knew I wouldn't have to count. So that was definitely a plus for me. And the holes are bigger. Um, even 18 mesh is bigger than cross stitch holes. So sure, sure. I picked up a couple ornaments and after that it was, I was hooked. I went way down the rabbit hole um, and oh. I've been stitching and doing needlepoint ever since. So you, you were commenting that it was right around the corner from you and you never even knew it. So right. when we moved my daughter in at Tulane freshman year, Mm -hmm. uh, we decided to, we had to, we went early and we stayed at a um, Airbnb on Magazine mm -hmm. Street. So I Googled, like I always do when I'm on vacation, Needlepoint or mm -hmm. yard stores near me. And I'm like, Needlepoint stores near me. And it says 350 feet. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, oh my God. And my husband's like, oh God, here she goes. Uh -huh, here we go. <laughs> so that was just kind of funny that it was like literally around the corner from where I was too. And I had no idea. So. That's awesome. Yeah, that's a great neighborhood. We loved living in that area. Um, I just, you know, wish I had kind of known about it sooner or picked it back up sooner. I would get so frustrated. So when, you know, I have ADHD and can't pay attention uh, and wasn't treated for a really long time. And so when I was stitching when I was younger with cross stitch and counting, I would get so frustrated with it. I would just, you know, give it up and, um, but once I figured, like once I found needlepoint and things being stitch painted and it was just, you know, the whole world sort of came back to me and it expanded. Now I'm, I mean, my husband will tell you I'm way down the stitching <laughs> rabbit hole. <laughs> In all the best ways. So yes, <laughs> that's great. Um, so what I think we're really here to talk about, um, besides I think people could probably care less about our New Orleans connection, but I have fun talking <laughs> about it. So thank you for bearing with us, everyone, um, is how important stitching can be in our lives mm -hmm. to maintain our mental health and our calmness and our serenity. Um, and, you know, I think many of us stitchers have read some articles, but I think mm -hmm. there's probably a lot to be learned from a professional who can interpret the articles in the right way and probably has a little bit more professional expertise than the average stitcher. So um, yeah, so do share. I don't know where you want to start. But. Sure. Um, it's so funny. I actually ask my patients and I keep, I, I've actually brought these home from the office because I keep these hanging on my keys on um, my, in my office. And we do a lot of virtual visits right now. And so when the kids I'm working with are stressed out. I'm like, what do you do to kind of de-stress? And um, I've actually had a few who are like, well, I knit or I do this and I'll go ahead and show them sort of some of the things that I do. Um, and that's helpful for me um, in hopes that they would be able to find something that works for them. Um, so I did do, I tried to do a literature search, um, putting in all types of different word combinations with needle crafts and mental health and, and everything. There's a lot more anecdotal and what we call um, sort of qualitative information out there. Um, so people's stories of how they find it helpful and things like that. We're starting to tie the type of craft to um, basically mindfulness-based type of therapy. Um, and when people hear mindfulness, they tend to think of meditation. Right. Um, 
And they are, you know, they can be similar in some sense where you're sort of focused on the now and here, but also have different properties wherein mindfulness, um, you're really looking to sort of be in the here and now and be aware of your emotions in sort of a non-judgmental area, non-judgmental space. I actually have the cutest um, little graphic I found that I really like. So I'm gonna pull up if that's okay with you. Of course. Oh, no, I can't. <laughs> oh, because I didn't give you permission to screen share. Let's see if I can figure out how to do that. Okay. I'm not super, uh, let's see, participants. Sorry, people, this is. Real life uh, Zoom technical difficulties. I, I didn't even think about that. So I don't know how to do this. Allow to multi-pin. I don't know what that means, do you? Multi-pin where if there were more than two of us on the call, you could pin a couple different videos of ones that you wanted to sort of keep in I the forefront. I make you a co-host. That's what I want to do, right? Allow participants to, well, oh, darn it. I'm sorry that I'm not a Zoom. That's okay. Um, Okay, I don't know. I, I feel like there's somebody out there that's probably so frustrated right now that I'm so dumb that I don't know how to do that. It happens. Um, so, it's a whole new world. Yeah, sorry. Um, that's well, all we right. Can, we can use your um, your thing as part of our promotion. Then people can sure. see it. Fine. How about that? Um, it's, so it's the cutest thing. It's just like kind of a very basic drawing, sort of almost stick figure like, but it's mindful with the two words spaced out and somebody with their brain sort of full of information, anxious thoughts, the whole deal, and then sort of mindful where you're sort of, it's sort of blank. You know, you sort of acknowledge the thoughts that come in, um, you recognize them, but you kind of let them pass without judgment. And I feel like a lot of people now, um, and a lot of the studies that we have coming out sort of in COVID error are sort of your mind's pause full brains. We are, we have so many things on our minds, so many different things going on, so many different types of new worries that I think we didn't really ever have in the forefront of our brains before this pandemic, um, especially in recent times. Um, it's just different. Uh, yeah, for sure. I, so. I, I know personally that, and I think I've talked to you about this, and I think mm -hmm. I've talked about it in one of my videos, when I went to get my vaccine, and mm -hmm. I barely hold it together and I think a lot of people were very emotional because they felt so hopeful mm -hmm. it felt like my situation was more that it was such a buildup of this stress and anxiety that I right. had even acknowledged myself mm -hmm. they're realizing that this is a point in time that I might be able to get past that or mm -hmm. begin to get past that um, and it, it took me so by surprise because I I think, thankfully, I've been super so busy that I haven't mm -hmm. had the opportunity to deal with my own emotions. And we sometimes do that, you know, we get caught up with day to day stuff in life and um, we kind of forget at times to take care of ourselves. Um, there's a big push now for healthcare workers and essential workers um, and being concerned about how we're all doing, you know, burnout is a is a real thing. And a lot of us um, are having pandemic fatigue at this point, um, even if you're not in a healthcare field or considered an essential worker, I think just most people I know are, are having some type of pandemic fatigue. Sure. Um, I'm sure you're busier than you've ever been, I would guess, right? The numbers have definitely gone up. A lot of the referrals that come through, we see, you know, may have had some stuff going on worse than during COVID or started, symptoms started, um, you know, when COVID started, we're seeing a lot of referrals like that come through. Right, um, I'm sure you, you are fatigued in your own way as well, for sure. Oh yeah, I try to, I try to take at least five minutes um, a day or at night, I'll bring a project with me to work you know, isn't able to come into the office or show, um, I might take that time to stitch a little bit and then take the time to catch up on other things. Um, but I also don't push myself if I am, if I know I'm super exhausted, I just let myself rest and I don't push myself to 
finish a, a task, which could, it, it, it can seem like at times when you're stitching, it could seem like, you know, especially with deadlines, finishing deadlines and things like that. Uh, sometimes the pressure is on even with stuff that is supposed to be stress relieving. Right, right. So let's circle back to that a little bit. Yeah. So um, as I said, I think it's, I think it's kind of well, like we all, we as stitchers like to, re we know that it's stress relieving, but is there like specific things you can point out to, to about that? Yeah, absolutely. So um, like I mentioned before, I went on my tangent. Um, <laughs> it's starting to be linked to mindfulness um, and mindfulness practices where you really sort of are in a state of awareness um, of your own experience. And it's your experience of multiple things, sort of your thoughts, how you're feeling, how your body's feeling, um, and really sort of being in that state without judgment. Now, when some people stitch they do, um, their mind may wander to different things, um, but in general, right, because you need to have that hand-eye coordination for the most part, you're redirecting yourself back to the canvas and back to sort of what you're doing in the moment. And other people um, become so focused on the, the repetitiveness of the stitching that they, their minds are clear. Um, you know, you sort of lose that, you know, train of thought or, you know, the rumination of things that are going on throughout the day. Um, which is really great. And I, a lot of people feel this purpose and intent with stitching. Um, you know, you're creating this beautiful thing. You will have something at the end of this that, you know, will last for a really long time. Um, and a lot of people like to, you know, for me specifically, one of the things that I'm working on is creating ornaments for my kids um, and sort of capturing memories that way for them. Uh, so I have, I'm doing the Morgan Julia crab bushels mm -hmm. um and the lobster dinner for them because when i don't i don't even eat it i don't even eat seafood but my um i know right um but my husband and my dad the night before i would go into the hospital to have both of my kids they would have a lobster dinner um and that's sort of tradition so you know i'm stitching two of each of those canvases one for each of my kids um but i you know again right could that be considered too much pressure on me? Am I putting too much pressure on myself? Um, but I know to take those breaks. Um, but anyway, going back to that, and then some people really like the journey of the project. Um, so you, I'm just grabbing my headphones case from my little one. Um, you know, picking, looking at the canvas, looking at the colors, picking out different thread types, silks, um, wools, whatever it may be. You wanna say hi? This is Julian. Hey, how are you? He's good. Mm -hmm. My five-year-old's playing outside, um, but Julian is, you know, he gets tired and he likes to be inside. So um, at soon I, he's gonna get one of those projects to start himself. My five-year-old um, will sometimes sit and stitch with me, which is really nice. Um, but yeah, so the, you know, the journey of the project too, trying to be in the moment with the that you know sort of just being aware of even like textures of um threads or fibers that you might be touching and in the COVID era of course that's a little bit different um but you can really be sort of mindful and aware of different types of things when you're in the shop and kind of going through that journey um so I think it's really cool um what they've there's no necessarily outcomes from specifically stitching other than like I had mentioned the anecdotal and um, some of the you know stories that people have written but as we're starting to tie this more to mindfulness um, in the literature there's a lot of um, positive outcomes from practicing mindfulness um, so a lot of what we see is you know some change in what people report so there is less anxious like less anxious thoughts less depression um, sort of a a sense of control over what you're doing. Uh, for some people, it really helps with sleep and their quality and quantity of sleep. It can help with pain. I actually, when I was watching the other podcast on needlepoint injuries, I was like, and we need to make sure with that one, when we're being mindful with stitching, we're sitting in the correct posture and doing what we're, you know? Um, but even being mindful of how your body's feeling while you're stitching um, is a part of all of this. Um, and then there's other health, benefits that we know that are more objective in nature. So decreased heart rate, um, improved heart rate variability. So um, the 
ability for your body to respond to stress by having your heart rate and your blood pressure go up and come back down. Interesting. Yes. Yeah, so um, we do know that if you have poor heart rate variability, you tend to struggle a little bit more from a stress aspect of things. Um, and so if you have good have a good response system to that, um, you tend to manage stress better. Um, but overall, it can decrease your blood pressure, decrease your heart rate, actually decrease muscle tension as well if you're being mindful in the moment. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of other positive things. Um, I could go on and on. Well, um, but they're act go ahead. I think it's really interesting. And it's so, so the part that you, you were talking about with the uh, variability, so it, mm -hmm. it almost allows you to recover from a stressful episode, whatever that may be for you, in a faster and more efficient way so that there's less strain in your body, right? Is that what I'm kind of hearing? No, oh, absolutely. That's amazing. Um, okay. Love it. I love it. Um, so though, to me, those are kind of like the physical benefits. Mm -hmm. uh, and we talked about a little bit about the um, mental benefits, mm -hmm. but I always, and I, I kind of say it jokingly, but I think I'm kind of serious that I'm convinced that stitching is going to keep me out of the dementia wards. Mm -hmm. uh, that's probably a, a drastic overstatement. Um, but hold on, our phones are getting out. Poor Becky. No, you the phone. Thank you. Um, but I, I feel like there's got to be a little bit to that. I don't know. So there is some in the prefrontal area of the brain. That's the brain. That's the part of your brain that stays organized. That's the intellectual side of your brain. Um, that is, you know, the planning, problem solving can also help control the emotion side of things and. So mindfulness and creativity actually can help that area become thicker and show an increase in activity of that portion of your brain. Um, so it's possible that it will help for, from a cognitive aspect of things. Um, but then also it has shown to, there's another part of your brain. I had little diagrams and I can um, put links to them after the, the podcast, just so you can see where they are in your brain, but the hippocampus area of your brain um, and that system is in, um, helps regulate memory and consolidate memories and things like that. Um, pause the recording and see if we can figure out how to screen share, would that be helpful? Oh, sure. Okay, let's do that. Hold on, we'll be right back. You guys won't even know that we paused. Okay, I think we've managed to figure out, I've managed to figure out, thanks to Lauren, how to let her screen share. So. We, you were saying that you had some um, data to share with us, right? Yep. Um, so I am, I should be sharing the PowerPoint and I'm gonna hit play from start. Hopefully it's up on the screen and you guys can see it. Um, but this was that uh, cartoon I was talking about earlier and how awesome I thought it was. And so a lot of us are sort of in this mind full period right now where there's a whole bunch of stuff in our brains um, where when you practice mindfulness, you're sort of in the present moment and focusing on the here and now. Um, and, you know, the smell of flowers, the feel of the sun on you, um, all the different types of feelings and thoughts that you might be having in this specific moment. I love it. Okay. I'm going to skip past that one just so that we can see this area of the brain. So this is the outside part of your brain and it's divided into all of these different lobes and areas. There's more even on the inside part of the brain and I'll show you that in just a second. Um, but this is sort of what I was talking about in terms of the frontal lobe and even down here a little bit in the prefrontal area is the area of problem solving, planning, sort of what we call your executive functioning skills, staying organized, staying on task, all that good stuff. Um, and um, so it's a little bit difficult to see, but hopefully you can see my pointer. Um, but here's your amygdala. This is sort of your fight or flight response area. Um, and this has actually shown to decrease slightly. So in studies of trauma and other types of significant stress, this area tends to be overactivated. Um, and that is what causes some of the symptoms of severe anxiety, trauma symptoms, et cetera. And here is that hippocampus area that I was talking about um, from a memory aspect of things. So that area actually can start to have an increased um, with functional MRI. So looking at how it's working in the moment, you can actually see an increased activity in this area of the brain. Um, so some really cool stuff 
from a mindfulness perspective that we're actually seeing on um, imaging in the present moment, um, we can actually see how the brain is working and the level of activity in certain areas. And that's how we've been able to pull this information, um, you know, to, to put in papers and things like that. Amazing. It's really cool stuff. Um, I mean, it, it's awesome. You know, but I'm also that's what I do. You know, sometimes I think we forget from a psychiatry standpoint that we're also, you know, we take care of your brain. It's one of the most important organs in your body. Um, and it it protecting your brain helps protect other parts of your body as well. For sure. Amazing. Amazing. So I'm gonna stick on this thought that um if I keep stitching that that's going to increase that memory portion, right? Is that what I'm understanding? Right? Absolutely. Mm-hmm keep me uh, living independently longer now that I, I mean, our bodies are outliving our minds in so many ways. It's kind of like Absolutely. I mean, it's amazing um, how that's happening. Um, but yeah, so not only that area with your memory, but the area with your organizational skills and being able to stay on task and um, problem solving, planning, all that kind of good stuff. Yeah, one of one of my other little side side jobs along the along my many varied career path um, when I was home with my children, they were kind of my primary thing. But I did work for about three years um, for a woman who had unfortunately had a traumatic brain injury and mm -hmm. damage to the executive portion of her brain. Mm -hmm. And she actually was a published author and a former physician, and I kind of helped her. I, I was her executive portion of her brain like I broke because if I could break a project down into small tasks for her she was totally good to go and oh it was she was a really an amazing amazing person but it was a very um eye-opening she hired me to do her financial stuff but then it became more than that because of yeah no I mean liability so it was really it's a very important part of your brain and you know you're just as amazing of a person for <laughs> being able to do that for her Oh, well, it was, it was, it was really, it was really good. Um, so anyways, we digress. I think there's, there's also a social side to stitching that um, to me, you know, has changed a little bit in the last year. It's gone from mm -hmm. real to online social. And that's mm -hmm. kind of part of why we're here. This podcast wouldn't have come to be without um, kind of our, our need for that. And I feel like that maybe ties into some of this as well. Oh, absolutely. I mean, we know from COVID, just the isolation piece of things, you know, without all of the other stuff is a big part of um, increasing rates of anxiety and depression and a lot of people and increase or worsening um, baseline mental health conditions. Um, and so the community that's formed in Needlepoint, I mean, it's just amazing. Um, I had no idea sort of the type of community or how great it is until I was in it. Um, and it's really fabulous. You know, there's all these different type of Zoom stitch clubs and meetups and I'll watch the unboxing Fridays. It's, you know, helps my Friday go well. Um, and so it, yeah, I mean, it's really, it's really great that there's so many different ways to get this content out and to be able to connect to people, even if you can't be sitting next to them in a shop or at your home and just kind of stitching um, with each other that way. Well, another thing that I think maybe separates it a little from some other social things is the, um, the friendships that are made irrelevant of how old anyone is. Mm. You know, I like, I have like all these really good customers slash friends slash stitchers, and some of them are in their twenties and some of them are in their eighties and it doesn't really matter. because it's, it's No, and that's so thing. awesome. It's yeah. so funny. Um, so I joined a group um, that was supposed to be Stash Busters 2021. It's not going well at all. Um, but in the group, you know, I, I can't remember how we got on the topic of ages, but I had shared my age. Um, and I was like, I have to be the oldest person in here, like by far, um, by at least 10 years. It turns out I wasn't. Um, but it was it, exactly to what you said, right? I mean, there's such a wide age range and it's just Instagram group text chat. There's a variety of professions. There's a variety of people. I mean, it's just really fun. And we all, I mean, it's like the, you know, some, <laughs> I keep it on during the day just to kind of check it and see what everybody's doing. Um, and so it's really helped keep me connected, um, 
to a whole bunch of different type of people. And it's really awesome. Well, and you're able to connect with people that are in all different stages of life and chapters of yep. life. And, you know, I, I, at this point, I don't think it's a big secret that Megan and I are probably like one of each other's closest friends now. And, you know, we see each other twice a year in person or whatever. And her mm -hmm. kids are in, I think, kindergarten and third grade, kindergarten, second grade. I apologize, Claire, that I don't remember how old you are right now. And my kids, you know, I've got one still in college and the other is adult children. And, mm -hmm. You know, she asks me many times, like, kind of parenting, kind of mm -hmm. like, what did you do then? I'm like, well, it was, you know, 20 years ago, but. <laughs> so. Yeah, no, it's it's so helpful. You know, some of us are married, some of us are dating, some of us are single, some of us have kids, some of us are trying to have kids. Um, some of us have older and younger kids. And so having just that support system, you know, it's so funny that the, the group was supposed to be to kind of keep each other accountable for stitching what you already have. And it has turned into way more than, than that. And it's turned into, you know, a venting place for us if we need to, a support group in a sense um, where we can share feelings freely and things like that. Um, and so it's a really nice thing to have. Good. Well, as, as a shop owner, I'm glad that you said the stash busting part has fallen apart. That's what oh, I, can, can I tell you, I can't, I can't it, it's been so bad. Um, yeah, we tried to do a no by February. I lasted three days, I think. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. I tell people regularly, especially it right now in the COVID era, should we call mm -hmm. it that? Um, like do what, do what brings you joy. Cause there's so many things right now that, you know, we can't avoid that don't bring us joy. Right. So if getting a package at your front door was a new canvas, you know, as long as you're not like living behind your means. Yep and you know other things that are going to cause more stress right um you know if you're getting a package at your house you know once or twice a month with a smile on your face then do it you know then so. go for it yeah I, I we i gave myself exceptions to the the no buy rule um so unfortunately the canvases that i'm trying to collect right now are either discontinued or where there's supply issues um and so when i see something i grab it um, but to your point, right, we all have to do things that bring us joy and we all have to find time for ourselves, even if it's just a few minutes a day to take care of yourself. Um, because, and the, the important thing is, go ahead. I'm trying right now um, because I am in the fortunate position that my business is doing well. I'm working so much that I kind of know that that's not totally healthy to be working as much as I am. Mm -hmm. But when I get home, I try to make myself stitch even if it's only mm -hmm minutes um and sometimes that's all it is like that's all yep. i can do but other times i sit down and i find i'm so much more relaxed and have kind of been allowed to shake off the rest of the day that i'll sit and stitch for 45 minutes or two hours or whatever but um if i carve that time out i'm i i know that i'm all the better for it. absolutely and scheduling that time for yourself is so important whether it's stitching or it, it isn't, or if it's something else, um, keeping that time for yourself is, is yeah. very important. And I, the point that you made about making sure that you're not living beyond your means, I wanted to touch on that too, because I think sometimes there's so many positives to social media and being able to stay connected during the pandemic um, through these means, you know, we didn't have FaceTime back, um, back in the day uh, to be able to stay connected with people. Um, but I, I worry too sometimes that the pressure of seeing things on social media or people posting their stitch mail and things like that. And so kind of knowing whether or not it's a positive thing for you is important. So if you are gonna hop on Instagram and get upset or distressed um, because you know you might be struggling financially due to the pandemic, um, people have lost jobs, um, businesses have closed, um, don't do it. No. Don't log on, you know, you got to do something to take care of yourself. And this may not be it right now. Well, and I also have some customers too that um, like set, setting aside any financial situation, mm -hmm. given their personality type, stash either brings them joy mm -hmm. or stash brings them stress. Like I, mm -hmm. in a kind of related, unrelated thing, like I used to get the newspaper. I had to stop getting the newspaper because I was never having time to read it. And then, mm -hmm. then I would file them up and then I feel like stressed that I wasn't caught up with my newspaper. Mm -hmm. And I think it can become that way with your needlepoint. So 
for me, I do have a stash at home, surprise, surprise. But I look through it from time to time. I think I'm going to weed some stuff out. Occasionally, I'll let go of some things, or maybe my daughter mm -hmm. will stitch something, or whatever. Um, but it still brings me joy. I'm like, oh, I mm -hmm. remember when I was in New Orleans and I bought that ornament, or I mm -hmm. was out in California visiting my friend and I bought that ornament. So that brings me joy, and I'm not living beyond my means. So that's all good. But for other people, if they had stacks of canvases at their house, there'd be so much stress involved in that because mm -hmm. they'd feel like anxiety, like I'm not doing what I said I do. I, I committed to doing that. And now I'm not right. doing it. So I think there's a lot of personality traits maybe that tie into whether that's a good or a bad thing. Yeah. And I think self-awareness and that's part of what mindfulness can bring about, right? It's just sort of a, a sense of how you're feeling in this moment with things and kind of taking that pause and being like, okay, you know, am I getting anxious because I have, you know, 20 work in progress canvases at this Doesn't point. Doesn't bother me at all. <laughs> no, I'm the, I'm, I'm the same way. Um, but it could be for some people. And there are times where like for myself, I'll start a canvas and part of the fun for me is learning new stitches and stitch choices. I mean, you know, I've gotten, I don't know how many <laughs> books <laughs> from you. Um, every time I see a different one, I'm like, ooh, I can learn from that one. And that's part of the fun for me. Um, but then when I do them, sometimes I'll second guess myself, does that really look right? And then I'll, I'll be like, okay, I need to pause. I need to take a break. I'm gonna go to a basket weave canvas for a little while. Um, and then I can go and sort of refocus myself on the canvas when that stress level has settled out a little bit. Yes, well, and one of my constant refrains this year has been in the last 12 months, I should say, has been just needle point. Like, you as a stitcher can't get stressed about it, can't, should not get stressed about it. I, as a shop owner, should not get stressed right. about it. Like, it is just needle point. No one's going to yep. bleed out on the table because I didn't get them their package or right. they picked the wrong stitch or <laughs> like there are the, the downsides to what can happen with our stitching is very minor in this kind of life. But I hear what you're, you know, I think this, we've had touched on this in a previous conversation, just sort of the convenience factor of what life is like now and how technology has allowed, you know, us to buy something online with free shipping and get it the next day. Um, you know, and so, you know, I, I miss Blockbuster, I do, and being able to go into the store on a Friday night and, and grab a movie, candy and popcorn and bring it home. Um, when now I can just sit on my couch and, and stream a show. Um, and so the convenience factor has, has really, I think, changed a lot of people's perceptions of when they, or their expectations of when they're going to be able to get something. Um, and as a small business, um, which a lot of our local needlepoint shops are, it's just the, the pressure of that or living up to those expectations, I think sometimes be really stressful, um, but taking a step back to know that you're providing a really sort of customized, specialized service that you're not gonna get in a bigger, you know, um, type of service that that's out there I'm trying to not name any names um, <laughs> as I'm speaking like um, with an a and n with an n but you're not going to say any names <laughs> no no um, but you, you know you get the idea that you know this on-demand sort of service um, because it, it seems easy but really we are setting ourselves up I think for failure and I think I'm hoping the pendulum at some point is going to swing back the other way a little bit um when people just don't want the cookie cutter stuff that you can get in a in a second or two well and i have to say to that point i i think for the most part stitchers are very appreciative mm -hmm. and patient um you know if i just have to send out a canvas and you call me today and say i want that canvas that goes in the mail tomorrow morning that's no right. problem but um you know if you want your um threads to be carefully chosen and have thought put into them mm -hmm. you know, that's, that's not a boom done situation right no absolutely not and it takes time even i'll start stitching something and feel like i need to change it um and pull some different type of thread for it it's you know i think that's part of the process that's part of that journey that i was talking about sort of um being mindful of that when you're stitching and you know is this really working am i liking it am i not liking it and you know at the end of the day, I feel like it's up to you. You know, it's so funny online. We'll be like, oh, do you like this stitch? Do you like that stitch? What are your thoughts on this? And like at the end of the day, that's something you are creating and you have to like it. Um, Correct. And I, I say that to people all the time. I, I can tell you what I would do, but it's not my canvas. It's your right. 
this is your piece of work. And um, in that vein, also, I beg people all the time, do not be overly critical of yourself. Like, right. you know, there. this is supposed to bring you joy. And mm-hmm. if you are making yourself crazy over it, then you need to set it aside and pull out that basket weave canvas that you were talking mm-hmm. about. Because if this isn't bringing you joy, then you shouldn't be doing it. 100%. Um, especially now, you know, I mean, there's so much other stress on our plates, like the stuff that's fun shouldn't bring you more stress. Yeah, I mean, we, we have to do laundry, we have to grocery, oh, shop. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah. all those things have to happen, whether you like them or not. But if, if you're in a phase where needlepoint isn't bringing you joy, then there's time that you need to turn it on its head in whatever way that is. Um, and give yourself some grace to, to be able to enjoy it again, I guess. But, oh, absolutely giving ourselves grace is such an important concept and uh, practice that we should all get used to doing. Um, you know, I, I did a straight stitch or I was supposed to do a straight stitch, but I did a tent stitch instead. Um, and I was like, do I just pull it out or do I just stitch over it? And I was like, you know what? I'm just gonna stitch over it. And if you see it, you see it. Um, but it's like four, it's four ply whisper and trying to like get all that, forget. it was like not gonna happen. Yeah. Um, and well, I, I left it. In, in the era when I actually used to teach classes, which seems so long ago, I can barely remember, but um, I used to tell my stitchers, let's do the dummy fix first is what I would call it, which would be like stitching over it. Like it would not involve any sort of ripping out. Mm-hmm. And half the time when you do the dummy, maybe more than half the time, probably 80% of the time you do the dummy fix, you never know what was underneath. So, yep. um, you know, go, go to the path of least resistance and the least stress first. <laughs> Because again, it's all about supposed to be fun for you. But in the end, if the mistake's going to make you crazy, then maybe ripping out. So. Right, and it's a learn. You know, for me, it's been such a learning process, and not focusing on maybe past mistakes with stitching, and just accepting that this is where I was at the time with stitching. When I pull out, you know, some work in progress canvases from last year, I'm like, ooh. Do I need to rip all that out and restart? And it's like, no, I need to just sort of accept that that's where I was as a stitcher and I've grown as a stitcher and that's okay. Um, well, and on top of that, then the finishers come in and they work their magic and suddenly like mm-hmm. all looks fabulous. So. Mm-hmm. Um, it's so fun. I was trying to make a an oval um, and I was like, do you think the finisher can, can make this an oval? Cause it's not really an oval. And they're like, yeah, it should be fine. <laughs> Yes, they, they are, our, you know, ace in the hole in our back pockets for sure, for sure. Um, and that thing I, I think is maybe worth touching on and it. We've kind of danced around it, but mm-hmm. uh, I think we're in an area, an era of instant gratification and mm-hmm. era where things are like fast done in an instant. And it seems to me that there's something to be learned from the fact that this doesn't all happen in an instant, that when you pick up a project to stitch it, you know, you, you do have something to show for it, which is better than doing the dishes because five seconds there's more dishes to do. Um, but I feel like, you know, you, you're putting your time in something and when you're done, um, you've got something to show for it. And a lot of my newer stitchers who are in their 20s have walked in and they're usually holding their phones. They're like, I'm tired of wasting all my time on this thing. And yeah. so that's why they're here. And I, I mm-hmm. feel like there's a lot to be said for all of that. Oh, absolutely. You know, this, like you said, instant gratification, you push, push a button and it turns on. Right. I mean, even yeah, that for your brain is you how to, how to share a screen. <laughs> yeah. But even that is, you know, it's so rewarding for your brain and your brain sort of gets used to that quick reward. Um, and so when you do something slower, it's like, wait, hold on. Um, it's stitching um, and consistently stitching will help you sort of keep that reward system at what we call would call like more of like a within normal limit sort of range where you can sit and have patience um you know and and i'm sure this is going to be studied soon but a lot of kids with access to electronics these days i worry about like rates of adhd increasing just from like a purely um brain mechanism standpoint like we know that dopamine plays the role and that's your feel-good hormone and your reward um chemical in your brain and um you know if we're hitting buttons and playing games and making stuff happen you're sort of over activating that system and so when you take that away you have to sit in the classroom it's harder to do because your brain is used to being so stimulated and so by stimulating your brain in a slower way and taking your time and having patience to work on things 
it helps in those times when it's not as fun for your brain, right? Like for me, charting, you know, typing up all my notes at the end of the day, that's, that's true. He's tired. Um, he tends to get a little cranky when he's tired. Um, so that's his warning sign that, you know, he's, he's needs to take a break now and go take his, you know, yeah, he want, he's screaming, he wants his shoes off because um, he's ready to, to take his break. He knows what he wants, which is good stuff. Good man. Good man. Um, but yeah, so like being able to train my brain while stitching and doing something slow um, and being really sort of mindful as I'm doing that helps me when I have to do the not as fun stuff. Um, because I am able to sit there and have the patience to go ahead and type up everything that I need to um, from a work standpoint. Um, so a, a related question that I don't think we've talked about it all before. Do you think there's a benefit or a negative to the fact that many of us, mainly myself, I'm talking about um, multitasking with stitch? So like I usually like to like read a, not read a book, but listen to a book while I stitch or watch mm -hmm. some ridiculous TV show while I stitch. Mm -hmm. Watch the podcast of Megan's while I stitch. Um, any of those things. So is there, is like that a plus or a minus or is that just an is? You know, I don't know a hundred percent if there's been, sort cause you're sort of like diverting attention in a way you're paying attention to your stitching, but then also there's another part of your brain that's paying attention to the audiobook or the show um, or whatever it may be. I can't say for sure whether or not it's positive or negative, but I think it's definitely worth looking into. It's, it's an interesting concept. I do similar. So I'll have the podcast on or I'll have an audio book on while I'm doing my charts because for me, that makes it easier. It's more pleasurable to have this you know, book on in the background. Um, but when we're talking about sort of being mindful with stitching, my guess would be that you would want to solely sort of be aware of what you're doing with your stitching um, and not have the other stuff going on. Of course, life is, I mean, you heard my kids like a minute ago, life right. happens and there's gonna be times where you can't sit there and, and be really as mindful as you would like to be. Yeah. Interesting, well, and I tend to um, watch things on my computer so that I can pause them at will. Mm -hmm. So when I need to like, focus 100% on the stitching I can. Mm -hmm. And then if the show gets really interesting, I can put down my stitching. So I, I'm multitasking, but I'm also giving things different priorities at different moments. Anyway. And okay. like you said, you know, it's it's in a way it's stitching and it's needlepoint and, you know, you're not worried about, you're not in the middle of a surgery where you might be, um, you know, needing full attention on something. Um, and so I would give yourself a little bit of grace with that kind of stuff too. if. You want to have your show on. I'm a big Bravo junkie. Um, while you're stitching, there's nothing wrong with that. You know, I, it's just like I said, we hadn't talked about that ahead of time, but I, it just came to mind that, like, I think for the most part, in, in in real life, they talk about how women tend to have a tendency to multitask, and men have a tendency to stay focused, and that really we as women tend to think that the multitasking gets more done, but in the end, really the focus work gets more done so yeah I think it depends on you know if it's a task that needs to get done and you know when you multitask maybe you struggle with getting the you know higher priority task done um you you know try to just focus on that one thing um but a lot of times we do multitask and get a lot of things done um who knows it's all a guessing game oh well anything else that we haven't covered that I think is a look I'm gonna take a quick peek at my notes Okay. I'm glad we were able to share our screen because I you had done so many great things. So thank you for that. Oh yes. Speaking of that, I do want to have these put up. Um, let me just get the right thing open. Um, just some resources for people. Um, some 24/7 hotlines. Um, nice. Hotlines you can text and and things like that. And then there's a website on here um, from Nami, and I'll go through that so people can see just what it is. Um, but this way it will be up and let me, let me do the slideshow. There we go. Now it's bigger. Um, so the National Suicide Prevention Line, it's a 24 seven hotline that you can call. Same thing with SAMHSA or the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. Um, all of these are free services. They're confidential. 
Um, they can give you information. Um, they can help intervene in a crisis if need be. There is a text line um, for some of us who like to text. If you feel like you're in crisis, um, you can just text hello to this number. Again, it's free. It's um, available all the time and it's confidential. And then NAMI, our National Alliance on Mental Illness, has um, a great website that not only has these um, hotlines or text lines as mentioned above, but also other types of resources. So if you are financially struggling um, or if you are in a type of domestic violence situation or anything, they have it sort of categorized uh, by different needs and with a bunch of different websites that you could hop onto um, and be able to see all of those good resources. Fabulous. Thanks. So I'll just leave this up here and then um, I could, if people would like, I'm not sure if people would be into this, but I'm happy to kind of read through just a brief mindfulness um, sort of script um, so people can just sort of get a feel for what you might be looking for um, when you're practicing mindful stitching. That'll be great. Okay, I'm gonna get rid of that. And that we can always post these too. Um, I'm guessing underneath the, the video, just some links. Um, okay, um, so feel free to do this if you want. This is optional. Um, you know, I won't be watching while you're doing this. You, you know, you can turn the um, screen off if need be and just listen to the voice. Um, sometimes people can get self-conscious when doing this in front of other people, um, but you'll be watching this at a later time in the comfort of your own home and you know, feel free to participate if you would like to. If you don't like to, that's fine as well. Um, but we're just gonna do a quick brief mindfulness script. Um, and so we'll get started. Um, I'm going to invite you to take a deep breath and when you're comfortable, begin to close your eyes. I wonder if you would take a moment to imagine yourself being more calm, peaceful and focused. And as you allow your unconscious mind to naturally conjure an image of what would feel like, consider what you might be seeing, hearing, and what you might be feeling that shows you are more calm, peaceful, and focused. And perhaps you already are feeling more calm, peaceful, and focused. If not, notice that your unconscious mind can reveal how you might do this. Now, maybe you can think of a simple way to incorporate this feeling of calm into your life in the days and weeks ahead. And after you've done that, know that it is it can be really easy to create a little bit more peace and calm in your life. So now I invite you to take a breath for a moment and begin to move your attention back to the room, listening to the sounds around you and begin to open your eyes. So it's a very short, very brief little script, um, but that could be done at the beginning of the day, could be done when your sort of stress warning signs are, um, you know, are, are popping up for you. Um, could be done at the end of the day, multiple times a day, whatever people would feel could be helpful. But taking that time to just sort of close your eyes and be in the moment. Um, one of the exercises that people really like is um, with chocolate um, or some type of sweet where you um, basically eat the chocolate or sweet. Um, and, okay. and you focus on that. So what it feels like in your mouth, what the taste is like, what um, sensation you might be having, how your body feels, um, but you're just sort of focused in, in that moment. Um, and that's a really cool one and fun one to do. Um, so I hope people find that helpful. Um, you can go ahead. I mean, of course you can Google some of these mindfulness scripts. Um, I'm sure you'd be able to, to find some other types of audio um, of mindfulness scripts, but you can keep sort of that being in the present moment and that feeling of calm while you're stitching. Nice. Well, thank you for that. Nice. You're welcome. Interesting. Good. Um, okay. Well, I love it. This is like I, my mind, it probably shouldn't be going a million different ways. That wasn't your, your goal, but it really is because there's been so many fascinating 
Well, I don't want you. And the part of that is not taking judgment. So, right. You're noticing that your mind's going in a million different ways, but you're not judging yourself for your mind going in a whole bunch of different ways. Um, just sort of acknowledging that that's happening. And that's part of the mindfulness piece of it, right? Like you're aware that that's happening, but you're not going to, you know, be too harsh on yourself for it happening. I, I can do that. I can do that. Oh gosh. Well, thank you so much. This has really been fascinating. I think it is a terribly interesting subject and I know that you took a lot of time out to prepare for this and to join me so I can't say enough how much I thank you for that so I'm hoping everyone else finds this as interesting as I did I sure did so me too thank you so much for having me oh my gosh it's been great well we will um I'm sure chat with you soon so thanks so much Lauren I appreciate it anytime take care stay safe